Amen. Open your Bibles, if you will, please, to Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9. It was interesting this afternoon. I was going through some messages and trying to determine what I was going to preach tonight. And I'd come down to uh, three messages that I had decided on and uh, was walking through them. And one of them was the message he preached tonight from the same text. Mine's a little bit different, but not much different. And I, I sure am glad I decided something else because I'd hate to make him look bad. And uh, <laughs> I think there's something about pride going before a fall. Isn't there something along those lines? <laughs> okay, we won't talk anymore about that. Look with me, please, in Hebrews chapter number 9, starting at verse number 1. We'll read down through verse number 9. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the gold pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the, of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as yet while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for all that you've given. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the first message. What an encouragement it was to my heart. I thank you for the man that you've given to preach it. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll help us now, help in these services Help me, Lord God, to, to preach the message you've laid on my heart. Help me to say the things that you once said. I pray now, Lord God, that you'll be with us. I ask that you'll fill me and use me tonight and deal with the hearts of these people. They've put in a lot of time, a lot of effort and money to hold this meeting. Let us, Lord God, meet with you more than anything else. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Hebrews is one of my favorite books of the Bible. I enjoy it. When I was pastoring, I decided to teach the book of Hebrews on a Sunday night. It took me two and a half years to go through the book of Hebrews because there is so much in it. And it is really, the book of Hebrews is a commentary on the book of Leviticus. I believe Hebrews is written by the Apostle Paul. You say, well, I don't agree with that. Well, you're entitled to be wrong. That's fine. I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, it's a free country. You can, you can be wrong along those lines. But I believe it's Paul was the writing. Paul was a very intelligent man. He was also a Pharisee. And he understood these things. He had a grasp of them that I believe the other apostles just didn't have the same circumstance that he had. Well, there was a problem going on in the churches. Uh, as you read in the book of Galatians and maybe across uh, some of the problems in the book of Acts, we find the Judaizers are following uh, people like the Apostle Paul and coming into the churches and saying, as was mentioned this morning, yes, it's good to be saved, now let's keep the law. And that's got to be part of your salvation. And so these Judaizers were coming in and they were causing problems involved with the churches and especially amongst the Jews. Because these New Testament churches were a new thing. This was different than they'd ever been around. And they were going away from the tabernacle. And the Jews that were in these churches were facing the difficulty with family and friends and, and relatives, all that kind of stuff that were saying, you're walking away from the sacrifices that God gave us. By divine direction, God gave that to us. And that was the argument. Had not God given that to us? And now you're telling us that they're done? And this is the situation that the book of Hebrews is dealing with. And the Apostle Paul is dealing with. The theme of the book of Hebrews is Jesus is better than. 
You say, better than what? Better than everything. Amen. Amen. And specifically throughout the book of Hebrews, he is better than all the sacrifices. These are the things. But the Apostle Paul in his writing is so specific. You know, can I say this to you? There's one thing about the word of God. Every word is important. The A's, the ands, the thes, the placements, the ifs. And all of those particular words, it, 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 we, we, when I was younger, I was taught to, to study words and to pay attention to words. And I paid attention to the big words uh, because, you know, I was young and I wanted to know what things like propitiation mean and atonement and all of those kind of stuff. As I've gotten older, I have realized the importance of little words. These little bitty words, three-letter words. And in this portion of Scripture, the Apostle Paul, in dealing with this, makes an interesting statement. Notice what he says in, in, for us in the very first verse. Then verily the, the first covenant, and he uses a word, had, H-A-D. It is a past tense word. Here's what he's saying. This is what was, and it's passed from the scene. It was given by God. It was directed by God. It had been what God wanted you to follow. But it's past now. And the reason for it is, is something better has come. And then he goes on to explain, and he makes this statement. He said, these things were a figure. So he points out the fact that these are types and figures of, of, of things that were going to be. And in many of the cases, as you go through the tabernacle and you study the furniture that is involved with the tabernacle, you can see the types and figures. And many of the parts of the tabernacle and the sacrifices point to the Lord Jesus Christ. These things go on and everything from the mercy seat to the Ark of the Covenant we find pointing towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a, the thing that struck me as I, I went through it. Uh, my pastor was preaching on the mercy seat and I'd heard many messages on the mercy seat but while he was preaching on the mercy seat and I was going through I noticed the things that were in the Ark of the Covenant and it struck me I, I, I have I had looked at it and I had considered it but I had never really preached on those particular things and there are three things that are listed in particularly in the Ark of the Covenant. There is the manna. We know the manna that was given that Jesus Christ is referred to as the bread and it points us towards him that was in there. We also have the the um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. Now, this is not the first set. This is the second set because Moses broke the first set because of the sin of the children of Israel. This is the second set that's in there. And then there is a third thing that's in there, and that's Aaron's rod that budded. And that struck me. So if all these things are types and figures, what's this a type of? What does it point to? Because this rod does not point to the Lord Jesus Christ. But what does it point to? And I began to think about it and consider it and kick it around in my mind. And, and you need to understand how, how my mind works. It works different than most other people's minds work. That's pretty obvious when you talk to me. But um, when I, I see something and I run across something... I, 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 I study those particular words, I read what the commentaries have to say, and then I let that thing percolate, if you would have it. I, I like it to roll around in my brain for a while. You know, and there's a lot of space up there to roll around in, so it has a, a good opportunity to do that. And I like to just let it mull. And, 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 you know, one of the things we don't do with the scriptures that is scriptural, we don't meditate on the word of God. We want, an, we want an immediate answer. Listen, the Bible is not Burger King, amen? It's not going to be your way, and it's not going to be immediately, amen? You, you, sometimes you need to let things, you got to think on things. you got to let things go in your mind. And, and when, I, when I study verses, I, I like to let things just kind of sink in. And, and I like to consider them before I jump to some sort of conclusion. And I began to look at this. And I began to realize, you know, this rod is in the ark, and the ark is a picture of Christ, and it's just an old dead piece of wood. 
And then a thought crossed my mind. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1, it says, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And I began to take a thought that came across my mind involved with that piece of wood that I am that old dead piece of wood. I want to show you some things involved with that piece of wood, Aaron's rod. And the more I looked at it and the more I studied it, the more I considered it, the more I began to realize how much it is a type of my life in Christ and your life also. The first thing that I considered about it is the position that it has. The position is that this Aaron's rod is in the ark. The ark is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It is a picture of him. And this rod is in the ark. I'm in Christ. Amen. That's my position. No matter what, no matter what goes on, I am in him. In fact, in Colossians, look over to Colossians, if you will, please. In Colossians chapter number 3. And if you'll look at chapter number three, verse number three, it, it makes this statement. It says, for ye are dead. There it is again. And your life is hid with Christ in God. My life is in him. My whole, uh, when I got saved, I was put in him. And I'm forever in him. That's my position. And I am hid in him. The devil can't get to me. The world can't get to me. Nothing can happen to me unless God says it's okay. The oldest written book of the Bible is the book of Job. And nothing came Job's way unless God said it was okay. I, I, I just stop and think about that for just a minute. Nothing comes your way unless God says it's okay. My Bible tells me that all things work together for good. Amen? It doesn't say all things are good. It says they work together for good. He spoke about the difficulties and the tragedies in the, pre the preacher just before him, Brother, Brother Graham spoke of them, and the tragedies that come into our life. And, and, and sometimes they are very, very difficult. A couple of years ago, my wife, she had her, her hip replaced. I believe it's about three years ago now, maybe, maybe four. She had her hip replaced. And it, just a, the regular surgery, and it, it got infected. And it got infected and it went through a series of things. And one bad thing created another bad thing, which created another bad thing. And before you knew what happened, my wife had had nine, eight to nine different surgeries, two more hips placed in, almost died twice, kidneys shut down. In, in, in fact, they called the, uh, our family in twice to say, she's not going to make it through the night. And it was a terrible, awful uh, trial that we went through for over a year, almost a year and a half. Some of you are aware of those things. But it was, it was unbelievable. And I remember my wife laying in bed and, and, and just, she's completely out of it. And, 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 and I've been praying and, and my family's praying and I didn't want to lose my wife. I love her. And dealing with the difficulties and problems that were going on. And she's there and the doctor says, she's not going to make it through the night. And I crawled up into the bed next to her and I said, please don't die. God, don't, let my, don't take my wife from me. I need her. Please have her stay. And she made it. She lived through it. The medical bills for that period of time was $1.4 million. She spent 63 days in the hospital, 21 days in intensive care. It was incredibly bad. It wasn't a good thing, but it worked together for our good. Some great things took place and many testimonies involved with it. Nothing comes into your life unless God says it's okay. He did it with Job. He'll do it with you. And that the, the issue in Job is not God having a game with the devil. He's not playing a game with Job. All you have to do is read the last three chapters and realize that God was doing a work. He wanted something done in the life of Job. 
And it was of absolute necessity for that to take place in Job. And I find that this is my position. I'm in God. I am in Christ. And, that, and I'm in there. And the things that come my, my way are either for my good or for his service. One of the two is going to take place. My position that I have. I find also that the rod had a possession. It belonged to Aaron. It was Aaron's rod. It's his. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I have been bought and paid for. Amen. Uh, he owns me. He has the right to do with my life whatever he chooses to do. He determined to make me a preacher. That was his decision. I will be what he wants me to be. I will go where he wants me to go. I will live where he wants me to live. Why? Because I belong to him. And if you're saved, get it in your head. I'm, 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 we have so much pride. He paid for me. And the price was his life and his blood. And he deserves and has the right over me. Amen. My Bible tells me in Ephesians, go to Ephesians chapter number two. In Ephesians chapter number two, we all like to quote the verses in, in uh, verses eight and nine. And uh, yeah, they work real good, involved with salvation and, and witnessing to folks. But sometimes we forget verse number 10. We, we like verse number eight and nine where it talks about for by grace are you saved. And, and, and we talk about, look, it's not works, it's a gift of God. But look at 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You know what God's doing? He's fashioning me. He's taken me through circumstances and through trials according to 1 Peter chapter number 1 verses 5, 6, and 7. He's taking me through trials to make me what he wants and needs me to be. Amen. My responsibility is to submit to his hand. While I was working on this particular message, there was a, I, I, and, and when it gets in my mind, it, and like I said, it rolls around, it rolls around, it rolls around, and, and, and I, I just, I have to let it become part of me. And so while I'm working on the message and considering these things, I was going out to the car to get something and I looked over in the corner of my garage and I have a stick in the corner of my garage. I almost brought it with me, and, and I, but I left it at home. Uh, don't ask me why, I have no idea, just, just didn't bring it. it. It is a stick and let me tell you how I got this particular stick. It is called a diamond willow. And that is what the name of the wood is, diamond willow. I was up preaching for Brother Humphreys in North Pole, Alaska, probably 15, 20 years ago. And when I was up there preaching for him, we went over to one of the church members' houses to eat dinner. And uh, when we were over there, the man was great with woodworking. Okay? He just, just did a great job involved with woodworking. Just fantastic. And he showed us their bedroom, and he made this canopy bed uh, out of this diamond willow wood it was gorgeous unbelievably and I, I saw that I said wow man, that is really pretty and I uh, uh, you know I, it was he did a great job I didn't think any more about it Friday night he brought me a stick of this diamond willow and, and it was about this tall okay and he said you could use it as a walking stick and he had it sealed he did not stain it he just sealed it so it, it wouldn't give me any splinters or anything like that. Well, I flew in. My wife and I had flown in to North Pole, Alaska, and I'm wondering, how in the world am I going to get this stick home? So when I went up to the desk in, in uh, Alaska, I said, I have a stick here, and I want to get it home. And they said, well, you can't carry it into, you know, you'll have to put it in the luggage. All right. So... What do we do with it? So they wrapped it up in cellophane, you know, 
and they, and they put it in with all the luggage. I figured there's no way this is going to survive. Have you ever seen them handle luggage? Have you ever watched them at an airport? Have you ever noticed that when you get your luggage back, it may be missing a wheel, a handle, or missing your whole luggage, you know, that kind of thing? And I figured there's no way this thing is not coming home in one piece. And I thought, okay, well, I did the best I could. I'll leave it at that. So when we got to the, the airport and we're getting our luggage, here comes this stick in one piece, solid, wrapped up. Now, the, the luggage that came down with it looked a little beat up. And uh, I didn't realize this is, I discovered later on that this is one of the strongest woods, a uh, piece of, the, the, the wood itself is one of the strongest in the world. This baby's tough. Well, I looked at this. I don't want a walking stick. I don't like it. I wanted a cane. Okay? So I told my wife, I said to my wife, you know what I'm going to do? When I get home, we get this thing, this stick home, I'm going to have it cut down and fashioned to my use. Amen. And my wife said, you can't do that. I said, I know I can't do it. I'm going to have somebody else do it. And she said, no, 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 that stick is too pretty. You, you can't do that. All right, fellas. You know how this is going to go. I'm not going to do anything to this stick. So I took the stick and I put it in the corner of the garage. Since that particular time, we have moved three times. In the three times we have moved, I have gone over and picked up that stick and moved it in the, and put it in the, in the vehicle, the, the U-Haul, and have carried it to my next place and then took it out of the U-Haul and put it over in the corner of the garage. That's its place in the corner of the garage. It is a beautiful stick. It's still a beautiful stick. Like I said, I wish I would have brought it and shown it to you. I'll send you pictures, all right? And uh, if, I knew how, if I knew how to use the Internet, I'd actually send you an Internet picture, but I don't know how to do that, so that's not going to work at all. And, uh, and so each time I moved, I put that stick in the corner of the garage, and there it says, a very beautiful stick and not of any use to me. It is my stick. I own that thing. And it's useless. And too many of God's people are like that to him. Because you won't let him fashion you to what he needs you to be. You won't let him work on your life. You kick against him. You fight against him. You question what he has for you. You won't let him work on you. He may own you. But all he does is stand you in a corner. Because you're not cooperative. You're not willing to listen. You're not willing to do it his way. You're not willing to follow these particular things. I see the one who possessed it, but I also see the power that it was part of. I went and did a study. Uh, now, I had an assumption. This is a terrible thing. I went into the Bible with an assumption. I assumed that Moses had a rod and Aaron had a rod. I just assumed that. So, with my assumption in hand, I went to prove my point. I think a lot of people study the Bible that way. They go in with what they have decided, and then they're going to make the Bible fit into their theology or thought process. And, and, and I've watched people take verses and twist them to fit what they want. Well, I, I had this idea. Moses had a rod. Aaron had a rod. And when I went through the scriptures, I discovered that's not true. And I was amazed by that. I could not prove that there were two rods. In truth, as I went through and studied it, I began to realize, you know, God had told Moses in Exodus uh, chapter 3 and chapter number 4, he talked about the rod that Moses had, cast it down, and turn into a snake. Amen? You remember that, right? 
Well, when they go before Pharaoh, you know who cast the rod down? Aaron did, not Moses. And as I continued to follow it through, I began to realize that there was only one rod, not two. So this rod had the opportunity to see great things done. The rod didn't do them, but the one who held the rod did. Moses struck the rock. He lifted up the rod when they defeated the enemy. We find the things that took place, great things that this rod was a part of, that this rod got to see, that this rod got, got, got in, involved in. Yet it wasn't the rod that did it. It was the one holding the rod. And then a verse came to mind. Go with me, please, to John chapter 14. This verse is hard for me to believe. It's, the Lord said it, but that doesn't make it easy for me to accept it. Listen to what he says. In John chapter 14, verse number 12. Verily, verily, that means, it gives an, it gives an infamous, infamous, gives an emphasis to what he's going to say. I'll get it out, just spit that thing out. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. What? Do you know what he did while he was on this earth? He says that we will do greater works than he has done. I didn't say that. You read it, amen? Listen to me. Here's what I have discovered in all the years of my preaching. I found that if I put myself in his hands and let him use me, that he can take me and he can show me some great things. Brother Graham talked about being involved in services. He talked about how the issue of being up and preaching and seeing God move or singing. He can sing. You know what? I hate preachers who can sing and singers who can preach. And I just want to point that out. I, 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 you know, I, I'm a one-talent fellow. That's all I got. I got a big mouth. That's all God gave me. And we'll leave it at that. Amen. But, uh, so I, I, I'm envious and jealous and all those other kind of things because I can't sing a lick. And uh, nobody asked me to sing any specials because it's bad. It's really, really bad. And... Uh, my wife tried to teach me and gave up on it. And <laughs> she can sing. I, I can't do that at all. But it, it, here, here's the thing I want you to understand. I've had opportunities and been, been preaching and seeing God move in a special way and watch him move in. And, and you say, well, does that lift you up with pride? No, I'm telling you. Because when it's God, you know it ain't you. It's him. And you watch him do things through you and watch him work in a great way. And I'm going to tell you something. When he moves into a service, it doesn't make a difference who the preacher is. We had a man in our church. Um, uh, he, 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 could, he could sing. Uh, like I said, I couldn't. And uh, he was actually my song leader. And we were at a camp meeting in West Helena, Arkansas. And uh, we had about three, 400 people. And the, 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 the pastor said to him, said, uh, I want you to sing a song. So he got up and he began to sing this song. And boy, we'd been in camp meeting for about four or five days by that time. And things began to happen. And folks began to come to the altar and start crying. And people start getting saved. And the pastor said, sing it again. He sang the song 31 times. We had 15 people saved. And every time he'd sing it, the altar would refill. Now, he needed the words for all 31 times, which was rather interesting, I thought. After a while, I figured he'd get the song down. But over and over and over again, and I watched God move in. And afterwards, his, the man's name was Tony. He came to me, and he looked at me and said, Preacher, what just happened? I said, God got in the words. Just leave it there. He said, he said Preacher, I, I've never been a part of anything like that. I said, well, you had an opportunity. Greater works
to see God use you to do something. There is nothing more fulfilling in your life to have that purpose on your heart to follow what God has for you and to see him do something that you would never have expected. It's got to be in his hands. The last thing I have for you is the fruit that this wood produced. Can I tell you something? It's a dead stick. It has no roots. Amen. It cannot produce anything. But it did. No, no, no. It is impossible for it to produce anything. It not only budded, but it produced almonds. It can't do that. But it did. Because God decided that it would. Years ago, we had bought a house. Um, about the time they had finished building it. And they got done with it. And My wife wanted these rose bushes. I think they're called knockoff or knockout rose bushes. I don't know, and I don't really care. So don't correct me because it doesn't make one bit of difference to me one way or the other. And uh, she wanted them in the, in the front of the house there. So I went out being a good husband, and I planted five or six of them along the front there. Well, they grew, and we had some roses come out of them and everything like that, and they were really, uh, they looked really nice. We got to the end of the year. Now, did I tell you that I was raised inner city? I, I don't know anything about farming or gardening or cows or sheep or pigs. And, 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 I, and I really, and, hey, it wasn't important in the inner city, just so that you know. And uh, so we got to the end of the year, and, and my wife said to me, she said, well, you know, you need to trim back those rose bushes. Okay. How far? She said, well, you need to cut off all the dead stuff on the rose bushes. All right. Okay. And, and you should do this in the fall or in, in the spring before it starts getting warm. And so it was in the fall. And Okay. So I went out and I got my gloves because there's pickers in them. You know, I got my work gloves and I got my tin snips. I, I didn't know you were supposed to have special gardening tools to cut. I got my tin snips out of my toolbox and I went out there and I cut off everything that looked dead to me. Okay. When I got done, the highest thing sticking out of the ground was about that big. Now that was the highest thing. Most of them didn't have much of nothing sticking. Well, it looked dead to me. Okay. I, I thought, okay. And, and I was so proud of it. I cleaned it all up and I got all the garbage out of there and I got the leaves out of there and I got all the bushes and, and I got rid of them there. And I, I looked at that and it, it looked, it, I mean, it was there was, you couldn't have told that there was rose bushes that had ever been there. I was so proud of myself. My wife came out on the porch and she looked down and she said, what have you done? I cut off everything that looked dead. She said, you killed them. Well, they were dead already, so I just figured to <laughs> help it along. <laughs> she said, they'll never grow. You, you done killed them. I said, well, then next year I'll just buy you some more and we'll plant them. The next year, summer, spring came and summer, and them rascals started growing. Now, when the, the first year they were about this high. But that year, they were this high. <laughs> Bob the gardener. Master gardener. Amen. Ha, I knew what I was doing. Not a chance. You know what John chapter 15 says? You produce fruit. He'll purge. He'll cut back things. You know why? To produce more fruit. You read John chapter 15. God oftentimes cuts things out of our life to produce more fruit in our lives. Isn't it interesting that this old stick, this old dead stick, is a figure in type 
of us. So I'd ask you the question as I come to the end of the message. Hey, did he have to stick you in the corner because you won't submit to him? Is he having to trim some things back so you'll produce more fruit? You're facing trials and the loss of things. Seems to be the theme tonight. And God has taken things away that he might cause more to grow. What's he doing in you? Will you let him have you to use you? You'll get a chance to see great things. You say, well, that's just for preachers. That's not true. That's for all of us. But you're going to have to let him decide. Will you let him run your life?